Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Welcome everybody to Nightlight. So glad you could join me today. I have just finished reading a fascinating, fascinating book. It's Deja Vu, Has Everything Already Been? And it answers a lot of questions. And and while there's, you know, while, while it isn't an absolute carved in stone, pardon the pun because we're talking about some of that, um, <clears throat> explanation it fills in a lot of the blanks that i've had for for decades and decades and decades much of it going back to what really happened before the last ice age where what what were civilizations like there had to have been civilizations there and this book really gives you um suggestions as to the possibilities and it links a lot of the mythology with reality so that it, it it gives you a better understanding of where a lot of our myths came from and and the fact that they they possibly were not myths but they were actually reality that, that we just don't have any written proof for. Um, this is um, the book is is just phenomenal and it goes into so many different areas that a lot of us talk about and wonder about but but you know we we'd have so little information that we kind of just are, are at loose ends with it like like are we the first advanced civilization on earth and how much time is needed for a sophisticated culture to disappear from the face of the earth and where were the civilizations in the past that were more or less advanced as our own today or possibly even more this book decodes numerous ancient stories of lost civilizations and shows how they corroborate much of the conventional evidence from geology, physics, archaeology, and other branches of science. It shows just how the time frames and locations described by our ancient ancestors fit into the remote epoch near 9,600 years B.C., just before the end of the last ice age and a date that Plato himself cited for the destruction of Atlantis. It also sur surveys the possible antediluvian roots of cultures in places like Egypt, India, and South America, categorizing the traces of prehistory global culture that likely survived the entire planet before the ancient Greeks encoded the secret information in their megalithic monuments the world over, most famously on the Giza Plateau. Um, the author is Alexander, and, and his last name I'm go not going to even attempt to um, pronounce because it's a tongue twister for me, but probably not for most people. So uh, I'm going to let him give it to you. Alexander, thank you very much for being here today, and how do you pronounce your last name? Hello, hello, everyone, and thank you for that amazing introduction. My last name is actually Czeszkiewicz. And it's sometimes hard for people from abroad to pronounce it, but it's no problem. Some people actually commented that they recognize me because they cannot actually spell out my name and say it. So that's a good <laughs> mark to be recognizable. 
Well, I just I can't thank you enough for being here, and I can't thank you enough for writing this book because um, it it fills in a lot of blanks for me because one of my major curiosities is you know fine they've written a history you know end of that last ice age everything occurred between then and now and it just didn't and I I my curiosity always takes me back to before the last ice age and and it it, it your book kind of indicates that humanity has gone through, uh, through a process it's almost been cyclical because they they have achieved a certain level and then some sort of major disaster happens and we go back you know back in time and and then we start all over again and it, it's sort of like um there there are there always seem to be teachers of wisdom or teachers of, of um, I guess, teachers of wisdom or teachers of mankind, there there almost always seems to have been a group that, that had more knowledge than we did that gave us the tools to sort of ascend again. Has this, you know, have you found that this cycle has occurred thousands and thousands of times? Is, 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 uh, is that sort of where you went with this? I think that there are many of cycles and there are cycles within the cycles. So there are bigger cycles like the platonic grid year of 25,920 uh, years. And there are, of course, lesser cycles within that cycle. And I haven't found that there is a catastrophe each of like those cycles of 25,000 years. But I found that some researchers pointed to cyclical mass extinctions on Earth that happens throughout cycles of some tens of millions of years. So there are such cycles, but maybe with more evidence and with more excavations, we'll discover that there are also lesser cycles that correspond to some catastrophes, like that catastrophe of the end of the last ice age. But for now, we have only like bigger catastrophic cycles. But I also think that even if there was such a cycle, such a catastrophic cycle that would happen like every one processional great year or every half of that year, it would be more like a probable destruction. I think that our reality works in that way that it is not everything is set in stone. I think that we can, like we can corroborate to not have that end of times, not to have that catastrophe if we want. To. So I don't think that every of that of those cycles is set in stone. I think of it more like the metaphysical concept of karma. That depending on our actions, there would be such a reaction. And I think that this is all about the cyclical time that we have to some. Sometimes repeat certain events from our own lives or from the lives of an entire civilization or a single nation and we have to make our own choices and make such actions as not to repeat the same mistakes. And at the end of my book, I even provide uh, the reader with some evidence for such cycles in which entire nations were happening, entire events were happening again after another zodiacal epoch, and entire nations were trying to fix the issues that were made in the past. So I think that it depends on us and on our actions. I, I think one of the things that... Um that has bothered me greatly is that <clears throat> given a um, hundred thousand years, uh, our civilization today, yeah, I mean, it, it won't be here. There's nothing that we have that is going to survive that long that we have created as, as our, ourselves. Um, you know, there are no stone edifices or anything like that that is going to move forward in time that, that can, you know, people can look back in a hundred thousand years and say, "Ah, yeah, that was when such and such and such and such was built." Um, when when you look at the the edifices, the Great Pyramid in Giza and some of the pyramids in in uh, South America, uh, you know, they have made it through thousands, some perhaps even more than thousands of years, 
and they are a testimony to a culture that was here that we really literally know nothing about. So so it, it appears to me that, that there have been really highly evil civilizations, and, and they have made an effort to provide history or, or a reminder that, you know, we were here. It's sort of like Kilroy was here and during World War II. The, the soldiers would go and say Kilroy was here and, and painted onto, you know, buildings and things like that. And And it seems to me like ancient cultures have try to let us know about themselves but we don't know how to interpret them i mean the great pyramid is one and gobekli tepe is another one and darren kuyu is yet another so um they must have known that something was going to end their civilization or they assumed it i guess because it just seems like they have left messages throughout time for us to discover, but we don't know how to interpret them. Yes, these are very interesting examples. And for instance, during the Middle Ages, Arab and chroniclers were very into ancient Egyptian history, but they didn't know much and they couldn't decipher the hieroglyphic script. So what they did was to find some local legends and some local tales and have them as the history of Egypt. It is interesting because they mentioned what you just mentioned, that the pyramids of Giza were not just built just to be built or just to be some sort of tomb of a pharaoh, but they were built in order to preserve some pre-Diluvian knowledge in the case of a global cataclysm. Because what medieval Arab chroniclers found out was a story of the legendary King Surit, who was often identified with the Egyptian god of wisdom Thoth or later ancient Greco-Egyptian Hermes Trismegistus. And according to this legend, Surit had a vision, had a dream about 300 years before a global deluge that it will happen, 300 years after his dream. And what he did was to build the pyramids in Giza, the three main pyramids of now Khufu, Khafre, and Menkaure. They are called today, right now, that. But what he did was to build those pyramids in order to preserve the knowledge, in order for it to survive the cataclysm. And he mentioned that he placed in the pyramids some artifacts, some books, some knowledge. And even despite not having any evidence for that, like we don't have any objects found in the Great Pyramid of Giza or other pyramids, we have some encoded messages in them, like the golden ratio, number pi, and many other astronomical alignments that may provide us the real evidence that this tale of King Surit, hiding knowledge in those pyramids, is true. And I think that it was the true purpose of the pyramids, to survive, for that knowledge to survive the cataclysm. And it's also interesting to me that he was so convinced that his dream was real and that this cataclysm would happen. Maybe it is some metaphor for some other, like, maybe forecast of such cataclysm. Maybe they, like we today, could predict that there would be some cataclysm in some years, like 300 years after this idea came about. And I think it may be, because it was the end of the last ice age we are talking about, that the smelting of the glacier started happening and people at the time could just see that there are glacier smelting so there can be a global deluge in some time soon. Uh, you mentioned the Great Pyramid and, and you did mention in your book the fact that the, there was the hidden hidden chamber in uh, the void above the uh, grand hallway there um there has been a lot of speculation as to what was is in it and and i i don't know if they have i i think they have put cameras in and they found that it was empty do you have any inclination as to what it was for there are plenty of theories as you mentioned and speculations i also only speculate i don't know what is there but actually 
They were sound by muon tomography by scanning with some highly accelerated particles in the great pyramids, many actually chambers or even halls as big as the grand gallery. So it isn't just a random coincidence and just one chamber found. There are probably many more. Some, of course, more conservative Egyptologists speculate that these are just, you know, empty voids because, you know, it was easier to just leave them empty, not to fill them out because it would just take much more stone and much more time, but it could be that there is something hiding in them. It could also be, if we find them empty, that some robbers or some other people just saw what was inside of them. But I think that still the golden ratio, number pi and man astronomical alignments are just enough to provide us with the information that some knowledge was encoded, encoded in the pyramids and I think that it is too much for it to be a coincidence. We know from many papyruses that Ancient Egyptians weren't that advanced when it came to geography, when it came to mathematics, when it came to, maybe when it came to astronomy, they were very sophisticated, but when it came to mathematics and geography, they weren't. They believed in flat earth and they thought that, and they had the knowledge of like, primary school or something like that when it comes to the mathematics and from what we know they didn't know anything about the golden ratio and I think that this is the evidence that the pyramids were encoded with some messages I I know and and they they basically um as as with the bible um it, it feels as though there there were myths that were handed generation to generation to generation that they were told so often they became history. Um, a lot of things in the Bible, um, you can go back in history and find that there, that there were very similar occurrences with um, people like Moses um, and the flood. Uh, so that I, I'm wondering if all of these stories that have that have traveled down through the thousands and thousands of years if if we're looking at a lot of material that we sort of are taking as history and it's it's not history from from this time frame it's history from past time frames that these these things occurred and every generation put its own its own fling on it so that so that it was adapted for that time frame and and we should be looking at these stories as as a reality that happened, but it happened hundreds of thousands of years ago. Yes, exactly. That's a great example, because, for instance, nowadays we know that one of the first civilizations was ancient Sumer, and we know that they were probably the first. But not many people know that we just discovered anything, any civilization of ancient Mesopotamia, Sumer, Babylon, and others, only in 1840s, so less than 200 years ago. Like 100, 180 years ago, we discovered ancient Mesopotamia and all of the civilizations and cities from that area. Before that, there were some incidents, but we just didn't know anything about the history of ancient Mesopotamia. This is very interesting because scientists and scholars remained totally ignorant for hundreds of years of their existence. And as you mentioned, we have plenty of things in the Bible that came out to be true. And he was the same case. We have plenty of ancient chroniclers telling about some ancient Mesopotamian cities and civilizations, and even in the Bible, we have a mention that Abraham came from the Sumerian city of Ur. But all of those mentions were simply ignored because we just didn't have enough evidence to support them. And I think that nowadays we're in a similar situation, that we have those mentions of Atlantis, of Mu, and other civilizations, cities, or lost knowledge, pyramids, and stuff like that. And many conservative archaeologists and historians take them as just mere fairy tales and imagination of our ancestors. But I think that 
it may be the case, like it was less than 200 years ago, that these stories may be, to some extent, of course, maybe not 100% true. And our history may be much older. You know, just 600 years ago, we thought that the first civilizations were those of ancient Greece and Rome. We ignored ancient Egypt, but it was there. We didn't know we didn't know almost anything about ancient Mesopotamia, but it was there. So I think that we shouldn't be that ignorant, like many mainstream conservative archaeologists and historians, to totally deny the existence of Atlantis or some other previous civilizations, because we we have been changing the history and we have been taking our history back many times even 180 years ago, which isn't that long ago. Well, I think the other thing I found fascinating was, well, you know, you, you speak of Atlantis and you speak of Mu, and it, it, it's, I, what I found fascinating was that you found, um, you found material in so many different places about Atlantis, not but it, it, it's in many other cultures that it's mentioned and i hadn't i hadn't seen that information before cuz you know a lot of people think that um while plato was a, a writer he was not a science fiction writer and and so that so that his material held great weight and and it's been kind of pushed aside because it, it you know they said it's only in this one place but reference to atlantis is in so many different places that you know, you almost have to step back and say, wait a minute, this this had to have happened. Uh, you want to give some of the examples of the different places Atlantis is actually mentioned throughout history? Yes, of course, but I will start with some new findings that are not in this book, but I will cover it up in my later books because I found out that there are even mentions of Atlantis from ancient Greece before Plato. And there is there are just some fragments of some poems that mention clearly Atlantis. Like, it is the same Greek word that is mentioned later by Plato. And there are also some evidence that there was a festival in which Athenians were just celebrating the victory of Athens over Atlantis, just as it is mentioned in Plato's dialogues, Timaeus and Critias, in which he mentions that those two civilizations, Atlantis and Athens, were fighting in the very distant times. So there is much more to Atlantis than Plato. And as you mentioned, in my book, I provide you with many information about other sources and I found out that there are many sources that are telling us of some civilization that is very similar to Atlantis. I found out that there are mentions of some lost civilizations, maybe not that detailed like the Plato's Atlantis, but which are very similar etymologically. We've got Atlan of the Aztecs, which is also mentioned to be the cradle of civilization, the source of civilization, like the Aztecs later. And there is also a mention that the Aztlan, and this very similar Aztlan Atlantis, and this Aztl or Atl in the Nahuatl language means actually water. So it is very, very similar to Plato's Atlantis that sank long ago. And again, in the story of Aztlan, there is a mention that it is white land. And we've got mentions also of water and some other researchers, I found out, also found some similarities between Aztlan and a myth from ancient Egypt. And I think that many of our listeners know that Plato originally took the story of Atlantis from Solon and Solon took it from ancient Egypt. And in ancient Egypt, uh -huh. we've got some Edfu texts that are telling us of some lost land that sank long ago, and there are some similarities with Aztlan of the Aztecs, so in Mesoamerica, long, long way, long, long you know, distance away, and also similarities between Atlantis. But there are also some other mentions that are very similar, like we've got Atlantis, we've got Aztlan, Atitlan, we've got also Aztlan, or we've got even Hindu Atala. There are some similarities between them, but what 
but I found some other more significant even similarities because here we've got only a name that could be legendary, but we've got also some similarities when it comes to the datings because Plato is telling us that Atlantis existed about 9,000 years before Solon, so somewhere 9,600 years BC. And for instance, in India, we've got a Tamil nation that is speaking of previous Sangans, previous city civilizations that existed 9,500 years BC. So like 100 years off from Plato's Atlantis. And I think that it is very significant and uh, that it isn't coincidental because at the same time there was the ending of the last ice age, many glaciers were melting, maybe some catastrophe led to those meltings. Maybe there was some comet strike or some solar flare and there were massive sinkings. And we know that today we also do that, that we build cities and civilizations nearby some rivers, nearby ocean, nearby seas and lakes, because it is very, it is very nice for us and we have plenty of materials, fish and stuff like that. So if there was some civilization or some city that was nearby coast, it could really sank at the end of the last ice age during a lifetime of a single individual or even faster depending on how that catastrophe happened. So there are plenty of similarities between myths from all over the world. I found also some similarities between catastrophic myths describing as some events very similar to what I have just described and I think that it isn't a coincidence. No, I, I totally agree. I think that um, I don't think they've ever explained the Darren Kuyu why they why they went thirteen stories down underground in Turkey, and the the other thing that that, that is always that has begun to be very very um, mysterious for me is um, Gobekli Tepe. They found another site that is very similar to it, and. Why would it be covered up unless they knew something was coming and they wanted to protect it? Yes, exactly. It's very interesting because the dates of Gobekli Tepe are very similar to those of Plato's Atlantis and of the ending of the last ice age. And we actually cannot date megaliths to to any extent, because we can only date organic materials. But why we are able to date Gobekli Tepe is because it was, as you mentioned, covered. It was actually covered with plenty of sand, with plenty of some other materials. And by dating those, like, accumulation of materials that it was actually covered with, we can date some dates. But these dates may be only of covering the Gobekli Tepe, these megalithic pillars. It may be that the pillars themselves may be much older than that. And as you mentioned, it is like very, very strange that they covered some megalithic like structures and some scientists say that even beneath the ground below what we found, there were plenty of more such circles of megaliths like in the Stonehenge. So why should they do that? Maybe it was the same reason why the pyramids were built according to the legends found by Arab chroniclers. Maybe it was because they wanted it to survive for later generations. Or maybe it was because there, was, there were so much floodings at that time that those floods accumulated those sands and those mud, and that's how Gobekli Tepe was covered up. There are like plenty of enigmas here, but it is very interesting because now we are finding more and more such sites nearby Turkey on the, in the Middle East that are also dated to so long ago. And it is also very interesting in the context of the theories. Like during the last century, there were plenty of theories appeared like the water erosion around the Sphinx and the idea that Sphinx is much older or the Orion correlation that the pyramids are aligned to the Orion belt as it was seen on the night sky during a very remote era of 10,400 BC. And these theories were rejected by archaeologists and by mainstream scholars because 
during the past century we have no idea and scientists were telling us that we have no evidence that people of 9 to 10,000 years BC were able to create megalithic monuments. But at the end of the 90s, we, find, we found Gebekli Tepe, which totally shattered that paradigm. Now we know that prehistoric people of some 10 to 9,000 years BC were actually able to build some megalithic structures. So it is so Gabakli Tepe is very important for several, several reasons. One was that it was covered up with mud and sand, and the other one is that it totally changed our understanding of the past. And if we were able to take the history of megalithic buildings back to those eras of 10,000 years BC, why we cannot why we cannot take like the origins of civilizations or first settlements even more than that? I think that we know actually a little bit about our history. We haven't dig up like everywhere on earth to such an extent to know everything about our prehistory. And within the time frame of the existence of human beings some 200,000 years ago, dates of some 10 to 15,000 years BC aren't that that long ago and I think that during that times there is a huge possibility for the existence of some previous civilizations. Well I know that <clears throat> that when you look at, at where Go Gobekli Tepli is and, and and of course in Egypt, I I think when people look at these monuments we think of, you know, how could they possibly have built there and we don't take into consideration the fact that because of pole shifts and and the the plate shifting uh, on the earth that places like uh where Gobekli Tepe is could easily have been um a very lush green tropical type of an area with some of the pole ships that go back that far so that so that the the land that that they're built on was not desert at that time frame and I think that, that quite often that, that isn't taken into consideration. We sort of look at it with where it is now, and we can't conceptualize why they would build things there. And yet with pole shifts and with the different um, the zones changing, um, you know, there was a time when Antarctica was almost tropical. So, um, you know, why not the same thing for places like Gobekli Tepe? Yeah, it's a great idea, but actually even without any pole shifts, we know very well that most of the Sahara in Egypt was very fertile and was very green even 7,000 years ago, if 7,000 years BC, somewhere about that. So even without taking into the consideration any shifts in the geography and the overall distribution of land, and climate zones, it is possible that during those ages, there were those sites, especially Sahara in Egypt, were much greener than that. And that's why people like Robert Shaw think that Sphinx and the water erosion around it may be from that very remote era. And it's also very interesting because, for instance, we've got Eye of Sahara that is very similar to the Plato's description of Atlantis. And it can be that at the time of Atlantis, this place wasn't actually like today Sahara is a desert, but it may be that it was just a normal place. It is very interesting, and not many people know that, but nowadays we know that the Mediterranean, like like Italy or Greece, is a zone which is very hot. But actually, even in the times of during the times of ancient Greece and Rome, it was different. There were plenty of forests, and the fauna and flora was a little bit different. But it overall looked very different. It was much greener than that. But because of the change of climate that is natural throughout history and because of the deforestation throughout the ages, the Mediterranean era is now as it looks like. You know, it is very hot and it isn't that green as like, for instance, my zone in which I am right now, like Poland. But in the past, it was very, very green and there were plenty of forests 
in the Mediterranean. So even like it was 2,000 years ago, maybe 2,500 years ago, there were plenty of differences in the overall like look and in the overall climate so when we take into the consideration dates of 10,000 years BC there could be so many changes that we cannot even predict we can to some extent predict things like like knowing because of some ground and of what the accumulation is in the ground but actually we are very limited, I think, to our knowledge, especially about such remote eras. And sometimes I think mainstream scientists do not have enough imagination to actually imagine what things could have been in those very remote eras. And I think because we see nowadays that changes are very rapid and that everything is in constant flow, that things could have been really different at those remote ages. You, know, you talk about um, the Turkish Stonehenge that I was not aware of, and that's even older than the one in England. Um, you want to fill us in a little on that one? Yeah, so I call the Turkish Stonehenge Gobekli Tepe because Gobekli Tepe is a similar. Ah. As in the Stonehenge, we've got pillars that are in cir- circular manners, and that's why I call it Turkish Stonehenge. Oh, okay. Well, that that would explain that then. Um, <laughs> the other thing that, that you mentioned here that I wasn't sure who you were talking about were the teachers of mankind. Who were they? Mm-hmm. As we mentioned, the flood and the encoding of some knowledge in the pyramids mm-hmm. or maybe even in the Gobekli Tepe, uh, in many places, on our planet, we have some mentions of teachers of mankind. And they are, it is very interesting because they are often associated with the Great Flood and that cataclysm that may lead to the sinking of Atlantis. Because, for instance, we know that the biblical flood story is the most popular. And when we think of the people that were taken onto the ark with Noah, there was Noah, his wife, three of his sons and three wives of his sons. So overall, eight people, Noah, the main hero, the Luch story hero, plus seven other people. And in many other myths, we find the same number. In India, we have the main flood story hero called Manu, who is taking onto his boat seven rishis, seven sages, seven teachers of mankind, in order to teach humanity basic stuff after that catastrophe, in order for knowledge to survive the great cataclysm. So we have plenty of similarities. We have also seven sages in Egypt, and we have also seven Apkalu, seven sages in ancient Mesopotamia. So there are plenty of similarities. But apart from those similarities when it comes to the Great Flood, we have plenty of myths from all over the world, actually, of some teachers that were teaching mankind basics of agriculture, basics of shelter building, and we can find such mentions even in Mesoamerica, in the Persian Zoroastrian law, we can find them in ancient Egypt in many, many places. And in my book, I provide you with some information that I think is consistent and that proves the point. But actually, apart from my book, I found some other very interesting similarities. Because we're talking about the King Surit, which may be the ancient Egyptian god of wisdom, Thoth. And according to ancient Egyptian mythology, Thoth, with his wife, was to introduce ancient hieroglyphic scripts to ancient Egypt. And we know that later on, one of the like symbols of Thoth was the Caduceus, so double intertwined serpents, like later Hermes Trismegistus stuff, it is called Caduceus. But we've, we've got some similar stories all over the world. We have, for instance, a story in China, which is very far apart, which is also telling us of a couple that introduced writing to ancient China. And it's very interesting because they are also symbolized by intertwined serpents. 
So I think that there is something to that and that we have plenty of the similarities between stories of some tears of mankind or some gods or demigods or just some characters, some heroes that introduce basic stuff to those primitive societies. And I thought of like the modern situation that we have been giving and we are still giving like modern technology and stuff to some primitive tribes. And what if there was really a catastrophe and after that some people went primitive or just stayed primitive throughout that period. It can be that when some other more advanced people like those riches, those sages that were to just hide the knowledge in order for it to survive the flood. It may be that after the flood they they again started to build a civilization anew and that they were teaching those peoples. I thought from that perspective that those stories may be connected to the rebuilding of civilization after that cataclysm. Well, it's, it's, I, I find it fascinating that you know so much is in Turkey in that area of the country, and, and yet in Mesoamerica, especially in the Yucatan, um, there's so much yet to be discovered. Uh, they've done, you know, uh, they've done LIDAR and they've done all sorts of things and they've found that, that there are cities and temples and all sorts of things that have yet to be discovered. And in a, in a way, isn't Mesoamerica as old as or older than the area of Turkey? According to myths and legends from that area, yes, but we just haven't found such evidence as yet. We have found some, like, primitive hunter-gatherers and their tools from very remote eras, like from era of Gobekli Tepe or even before that, but we haven't found just as enigmatic and advanced thing as Gobekli Tepe there. But according to the myths from the Yucatan area, from Mayas and Aztecs, the... They're actually, those people came from some lost civilizations. And this is very interesting because in the Maya lore, we have even a mention that there were two civilizations. That one, that one group of people came from the east and one came from the west. And it may be a good example of the coexistence of Mu or Lemuria on the Pacific Ocean and uh, Atlantis on the Atlantic Ocean or somewhere beyond the Hercules Pillars as Plato is describing it. And it may be that, you know, the history and the things, those stories of those people are that old or even older. But I think that the Yucatan and Mesoamerica was populated later on, as it is in those stories. But in South America, we have some researchers that that are pointing out that the megaliths, like in Cusco, Peru, Sexaiquaman, and in Puma, Punco, and Tiwanaku, may be much older. So maybe South America was settled before, but the Yucatan, but we haven't got any that strong evidence like the Gopekli Tepe when it comes to the Mesoamerica. But we have the, for instance, the three main pyramids in Tenochtitlan in Mexico, which are aligned the same way as the pyramids in Giza, and even the base of the biggest pyramid of the sun in 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 Teotihuacan, sorry, in Teotihuacan in Mexico, is actually the same as the Great Pyramid of Giza. So I think it is beyond the coincidence, because we have two things, the alignment to the Orion Belt constellation, and we have uh-huh. the same base of the biggest pyramid. So it may be that maybe that side is much older, or it's, it is just stylized for that older sites like the Giza Pyramid. So maybe it is, it is that. But again, I think that it was this area was populated later on, as it is mentioned in the text. Well, I think there are two sim- one similarity that that has always kind of puzzled me. In Gobekli Tepe, a lot of the uh, a lot of the engravings on the stones are of animals that are not indigenous to that area, and then you go again across the Atlantic to the Nazca lines, and a lot of the animals that are um, 
that are depicted in the in the glyphs in the Nazca lines are not indigenous to that area of the country either now so where did the the inspiration for those engravings come from if it didn't come from a time before the last flood yes that's a good point and in Pumapunku for instance uh, which is speculated by some researchers to be much older than the mainstream scholars are portraying it we find a depiction of like an elephant, but some researchers point that it may be a toxodon that actually went extinct at the end of the last ice age. And researchers like Graham Hancock think that it may be that this site is like Atlantis from before the last ice age. And at that time, there were toxodons, a very similar creatures to another elephant there. Or it may point out that there were some intercontinental travels to Africa where we find uh, animals like elephants. But when it comes to Gobekli Tepe, apart from those and those species that aren't there, we have also some depictions similar to a comet strike. But this, you know, is a single piece of evidence. It may be a coincidence. But then we have some pillars and we have some like stages which have a very similar persons portrayed to the Moai of the Easter Island. We have the same, the same style of hands touching the belly, and we have even those chins that are elongated like on the Moai on the Easter Island. And again, a similar stature to that of the Moai of Easter Island can be found in Peru, in the Chachapoya culture, which is almost identical. And I found many other similarities between those stages and also between those, I call it, pre and megalithic architecture. We have some things that may point that many of those sites, megalithic sites, and many of those stages are actually pre or may have or may just have the same exact source in that previous civilization. And it may be that maybe those stages were carved later on, but with the knowledge and with the tradition and legends from much older civilization. Well, with the um, over the thousands of years and, and the melting of the ice and then, of course, the refreezing of the ice, um, I think that, that it, it, the, the Atlantic Ocean, anyhow, was at some time 400, 400 feet lower than it is now, and that there may well be remnants of many civilizations that we haven't yet been able to discern or find that, that can help to fill in some of the gaps. But you you make a great case for renewing um, Atlantis and um, Mu, and, and certainly Nan Madal is one of those sites that, that they can't explain the basalt um, the basalt rock stones that are there, and the theory is a theory. One of the theories is that Namadao was created to mark where the sinking of Mu was, so that so that what we have been told were just fables uh, are are coming more and more into the fore as being realities and. And that would explain um, Easter Island and, and a lot of the um, islands out there in the Pacific that, that were once all a part of a, a continent that has since sunk to the sunk beneath the sea. Because when you take 400 feet of sea level, that's a lot. That will cover a lot of, uh, of territory for sure. Yeah, it covered. It actually covered a, ther uh, a territory larger than modern North America. So it could actually lead to the sinking of many civilizations. And we know, as I mentioned, that people often build cities and civilizations or settlements nearby some water reservoirs. So most of those cities, civilizations or settlements would really sink during the end of the last ice age. And it is very interesting because we find many of like remnants of some settlements, of some buildings that are now 
very submerged beneath the water level, which may point that there are really plenty of such remnants of some previous cities and civilizations. And actually, seas and oceans are very, very are not that much discovered. Like we know plenty of things that are in space because it is much easier for us to explore space than it is the ocean floor. So there may be much more hidden beneath the waters. But also when it comes to Atlantis, which was somewhere, which was somewhere away from the Gibraltar, right? So somewhere on the Atlantic Ocean, maybe it may be that it was somewhere on the ridge and on the connection between two plate tectonics and it may be because Atlantis according to Plato was very mo mountainous and a very highly elevated continent or very highly elevated uh, island and it may be that it was subdued because of the plate tectonics and that's why we haven't discovered it because it was just taken onto beneath some other plate. I think that this theory is very logical and it may be that it was really the case. But for instance, we nowadays find some remnants, some things that are looking like monuments or even pyramids that are found on the ocean floor nearby Azores, which may be the location of Atlantis. And I think that we, we just haven't discovered much of the Earth. How deep we have drilled to this day, we've drilled somewhere about 8,000 kilometers, 8,000, I think 8 kilometers, we drilled 8 kilometers deep, and we know that our Earth is much deeper, so I think that many of the remnants may still lie beneath the ground, and even conservative Egyptologists, like for instance Zahi Havas, who is very skeptical and against any theories of previous civilizations, and he's very conservative, and he's saying that 70% of all of ancient Egypt still lies undiscovered underneath the sands of the, de sands of the desert. And I think that if, if he, as a conservative Egyptologist, is saying like that, there may be much more to that. And there may be like even 80 to 90 percent still lying beneath the ground. And it is just the case of Egypt. And we do not know what lies beneath plenty of other areas on the entire globe. Well, yeah, and I think one of the things that has always befuddled me is how in the tombs um, there there are the, the beautiful paintings and, and hieroglyphs that that show no sign of soot or anything that, that they couldn't have used um, torches or anything like that. And there is a hieroglyph of what, what appears to be an electric bulb uh, that, that would suggest that they had electricity in Egypt, and that's how they were able to paint all of the um, paintings without without um, coating the entire insides of the tombs with soot. And if and if that's the case, then then we have to give much more credibility to those civilizations that we 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 can't really touch yet but but the remnants of them are definitely there and it is the out of place objects are becoming more and more um there are more and more of them and we have to acknowledge the fact that that a culture that was far even beyond our own may well have been here and and we're seeing remnants of it but for some reason science doesn't want to acknowledge the fact that that there might have been a, a civilization that was here that was destroyed and, and we're finding pieces of it in so many places and sooner or later we've got to acknowledge the fact that there was that civilization. Yeah, sure. Science is, of course, a solid foundation and it is very hard to actually make a paradigm shift to change our paradigms because if we change a paradigm, if we, for instance, acknowledge that those out-of-place objects are the evidence for lost advanced civilizations, it would mean that we should shatter almost everything we knew about history. But it is very hard, not maybe not to do that, because it's not hard to do that, but it is very hard because it may have very 
big consequences. For instance, if it later happened that these out-of-play objects aren't actually out of place and we find another explanation, we would have to admit that we made a mistake and the paradigms are always very conservative because they aren't to be just, you know, taken as false and then later reclaimed. So I think that we still need even more evidence to do such a paradigm shift to just change the entire science and change our entire understanding of the past. But these out-of-place objects, these stories and everything like that may point to a huge possibility. But possibility is far, far away from the actual, you know, understanding and from the actual model of how the things unfolded in our past. I think that we still need some more evidence, but all of that, I, all of the things I shared in my book and all of the things I'm sharing provide us with enough evidence to completely deny the argument that we have evidence against lost civilizations, that we can actually exclude their existence and take them as fairy tales. That was actually the reason I'm doing it and the reason I wrote that book. And I think that with more and more evidence, we will be changing our perspective on the past. But now we need even more of things like that. But I think that even those things are enough. And I think that it is a good, it is a good argument that these things show us that we shouldn't exclude a possibility of those lost civilizations and this should show us that there is much more to our past and that we do not know everything about it. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're very much like early man in that we can only interpret according to our own frame of reference. And if something doesn't fall into our frame of reference, then it can't possibly be real. And and you know it it it's, it, be, it it really um, is confusing because it seems to me rather than looking to the source of where something came from and how it got to be there, I'm thinking of that that machine that that was uh, found underwater in a shipwreck that I can't remember what they call it, but it has all sorts of gears and everything in it, and they say it was some sort of astronomical um, machine that could predict astrology and, and things like that. Um, and, and you look at the light bulb in the, in the Egyptian temple and you look at some of the other things that are so out of place in history and yet they're there and they carbon date back to a time that is so ancient. It's amazing. And it, it's incredible that... that you know, you kind of, people just kind of step back from it and say, well, I'm not going to deal with that because there's no more evidence around it. So therefore, it can't be real. It must be an anomaly and not reality. And at some point in time, anomalies are going to become reality. And, and we may be on the edge of that. Hopefully we are because your book certainly pulls a lot of material out and put it, put, you put it down on paper and anybody who reads this book is certainly going to sit back and say, I always wondered that, and now this makes more sense to me. So I, I think that I, I do want to put it, the book is Deja Vu, has everything already been, and you have you have put forth a very good case for people to consider that, yeah, it has been, and we're going through cycles, and let's see if we can do better this lifetime. Yeah, that's a good summary. And as you mentioned, those anomalies, if we have enough of them, they start to actually change and shift the paradigm. But, you know, we still have some of the anomalies. We need much more anomalies. But thank you for such a good review of my book. I hope that everyone reading and listening would take some knowledge and would actually benefit from all of that and i think that yes that now we are like as you mentioned we are very early into that maybe not very because such theories were circulating for about a century like a hundred years but now with all of the technology with all the knowledge we have solid foundations 
and we have solid evidence to show that there is much more to our history. But as I mentioned, even I don't know how it was exactly. We do not have like exact descript exact descriptions. Like Plato is is not giving us an answer that there were skyscrapers and there were flying cars and stuff like that. We have some of that in ancient Indian epics, but still there is much more to our history and we have many of evidence for that. Absolutely. I thank you so much for your time today. I so appreciate your taking it and, and sharing with us so much of your knowledge. Um, I do look forward to your next next book or books because Clearly, you're bringing a lot of material into the fore for people to look at, observe, and take into consideration when they they take a look at history because it is time that history was upgraded just a little bit. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. I just so appreciate what you've done and the material you've put out there. And the book, again, is Deja Vu, Has Everything Already Been? And... You read this book and you're going to say, darn, I guess it has been. There there must be something to this. And if you make people think and research, then you've, you've absolutely uh, succeeded in, in what you intended to put out there. Yes, thank you very much. It was really amazing talk and it was a really great interview all the questions and all the conversations all the topics i think that we even went much beyond my book but in my book i wanted to like lay the foundations for all of that so i also thank you very much well thank you again and um i look forward to your next book we will certainly once it's translated um have you back on again so thank you again And I want to thank everybody for being here. We'll certainly keep you updated. There's a great show coming on tomorrow night. So please check us out and check the calendar out and join us again. Good night, everybody.